if we're going to be on mic. Can you, you can turn that thing off fairly fast, right? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. if people start coming in and out, we'll move to my office. Okay, no Just problem. Just my office is a mess. So. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah. So, Kay. Myron, give me a two-minute version of, like, what, what siren called you to winemaking here in Oregon? Um, basically, the siren was uh, Pinot Noir. Um, I used to take trips from Seattle where I was living to the wine country. Um, it became my main occupation. And I started going to San Francisco and visiting wine shops too and buying European wines. I tried Burgundy, fell in love with it. Um, I originally was going to have a winery in the Seattle area uh, up at Port Townsend um, where I had a farm. But um, this vineyard came up for sale when my friends got divorced. And uh, I said, wow, you know, you can't make good Pinot Noir in Washington. And so I'll, I'll move down to Oregon to f follow it. What were you, I can't remember, what were you doing before you, um, before the call of the Pinot? Well, I was, um, I was working, uh, at, at just before I, I, I quit and came down here, I was working at the Patel Human Affairs Research Centers in uh, Laurelhurst in Seattle as a research assistant. And before that, I worked for the University of Washington as an assistant to the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Um, and uh, basically, I ran into the PhD wall in academia and in research institutes. If you don't have PhD after your name, nobody listens to what you said. It's so um, I just finally, I mean, I was working under a PhD who in the two years I was there produced no written works. And I produced um, the first book the world has ever had on condoms and a um, a study of the abortion rights uh, vote in Washington State in 1960-something or other, or 70, I think it was 1970. Um, uh, you know, a, a, a brochure, pamphlet, whatever you want to call it. And the other guy had produced nothing, And uh, but um, when my book was ready to come out, everybody else there who had done almost nothing on the book had their names put above mine um, because uh, they were the director and the assistant director and everything and so forth. And uh, so I just said, okay, I'm getting out. And you had uh, a farm, you say, in Port Townsend? Yeah. What, what kind of farm or what did you... Uh Oh, it was just a, a little, it was a 10-acre farm with 1,500 feet of waterfront, and, wow. and it had a barn and a house on it, and I had bought, I started out, my dad uh, left me a small piece of land, my, myself, my brothers, and and uh, I just, part of the property, it was a farm that this group of my dad and a bunch of friends, colleagues at the university and other people who were active in Port Townsend School, the summer arts, um, had bought this farm together and the, I, the agreement was that everybody would offer the, their property to one of the other owners before an outsider got it. And when my father died, uh, the lady who put the whole deal together, Mary Johnson, um, sold the piece that had the access to the beach. Um, to somebody without even consulting uh, because she thought we wouldn't be interested. And that guy turned out to be a land speculator. And so I got panicked and bought and started buying up all the other shares and put together this uh, this farm. And I was going to put my winery in the barn. I had somebody rebuilding the barn. Um, they were living in it and they were supposed to convert it into something that could become a winery and of course I didn't they were there and I was uh, in Seattle and they uh, anyway it's a long story but that was my idea and if I'd followed through on this idea I'd probably be a multi 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 millionaire by now because waterfront has gone through the roof number one number two as I predicted Port Townsend has become the little she she place for everybody to go 
and now there are people putting in wineries up in Port Townsend. Um, and if I'd done it back then, uh, when everything was, uh, you know, it would have been there. But I fell in love with Pinot Noir, and uh, so I moved down down here, and I'd been uh, um, uh, working part-time at Associated Vintners uh, since my tenure at the university on weekends and then when I got laid off by the university because I was the there was three assistants to the vice president and the only one who hadn't signed up in a PhD program or in a, a master's program was me and so when the budget got cut I went I, I got uh, ousted um, so, so what I, were you doing at Associated Vintners? I, I was just a seller rat uh -huh. I, I um, Associated Vintners. The main participants were the uh, the head of the law school, the dean of uh, the College of Liberal Arts, uh, Lloyd Woodburn. Uh, he was the winemaker, and uh, uh, I just happened to meet them in the faculty club when I was having lunch with my mother one day, and hear them talking about making wine. And this was back when Washington wine was garbage and nobody would uh, drink it um, and uh, I said you guys are really making vinifera wine in Washington and they said yes and so I went out and visited their winery uh, they invited me that weekend and while I was out there uh, the, uh, the the head of the vice president for fisheries was also a partner and he'd just come back from Russia uh, consulting with the Russian government and he had big loaves of black peasant bread and about two or three pounds of caviar and you know we went out there and there they opened up all these bottles of wine and talked and everything I just fell in love with it because I'd been a winophile now I was getting to see the production side and so I said well you guys look like you could use help and so I started volunteering and then when I got laid off by the university I was experienced enough that they hired me for one harvest you know crush uh -huh. then I then one of my colleagues at the university moved to Battelle Memorial Institute and he hired me to work there at the Human Affairs as his assistant uh -huh. and uh, uh, as it turned out he didn't last very long but they kept me on and uh, so I was there and I kept working so I decided I was going to do this winery up in Port Townsend so I started buying dairy tanks and I joined a winemaking club so we had a we made our first homemade wine which and was you were pulling the fruit what from like from Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington uh -huh. yeah and that's what I was going to do in Port Townsend is bring the, the uh -huh. fruit over to Port Townsend you know yeah. the same model I mean you know basically the the um, for the first 20 years of the Washington wine industry, there was almost, n except for Chateau Saint Michel and Associated Vintners, there was nobody in Seattle. Um, everybody was over on the east side, and then the, everybody started to see what that it was uh, easier to be closer to your customers. And so now there's, I don't know. 40 or 50 wineries in Woodenville, yeah. all clustered around near Chateau Saint Michel and Columbia. Yeah. You know, it's become a little wine ghetto, and uh, uh, well, it's perfect because you know, you know, they're in the middle of two million people, and you know, you can imagine how much of their sales go out the front door. So, yeah. and they're they're they're, they're they're not only in two million; they're in the middle of the they're right next to Microsoft and all those uh, yeah. people. So they're in the middle of a very wealthy area. So, Myron, what was it about Pinot uh, that attracted you? I mean, because, like, you know, it's like you're up there in, in, in Woodenville or, you know, yeah. Fort Townsend in eastern Washington. is like Pinot is a far... Well, it's, it, it's interesting, Giannis. The uh, Associated Vintners, one of the first grapes that they made was Pinot Noir. Really? And where they, were they pulling the fruit? From Yakima, from Sunnyside. From Yakima? From, the sunny, from Sunnyside, the, the, the town of... Uh, uh, Sunnyside in the Yakima Valley, and they were making, uh, they made Pinot Noir, Cabernet, Gewürztraminer, I don't think they made Merlot, um, Chardonnay, I don't think they made Riesling. Those were the four varieties that they f they focused on. 
and they made, you know, okay pinots, but they made them every year, and I got to work with it and, and, and see it, and I, I kind of liked it. And, so uh, what, was, what was it about pinot that attracted you, as opposed to, you know, a cab or, a, you know, one of the other varietals? Um, I think, see that, um, a, a well-aged Pinot Noir, a, a, a great, a good or great well-aged Pinot Noir has kind of a, has a silkiness to it, number one, has a sort of ethereal quality to it, um, has layers and layers of complexity, um, and you know, it's 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 an incredible experience. Um, uh, and I was lucky because back in the early '70s, you could buy Premier Cru Burgundies for under ten bucks a bottle. I mean, Burgundy wasn't expensive back mm. then, you know, and so going down to um, San Francisco where they had direct importers who were bringing in burgundies directly with nobody else, you know, they were, they were fairly inexpensive. And, um, uh, you know, and I, I tried, tried some of them and I just, uh, you know, I wish I could tell you that I tasted X wine and that's what did it, but I don't, I don't have any, uh, you know, uh, memory of a, of a specific thing, but it just, it just sort of started growing on me, and then I heard that, that uh, Oregon was starting to grow Pinot Noir, and, and uh, I stopped and tasted Hillcrest's uh, 1970 Pinot Noir, which is one of Oregon's great Pinot Noirs. Uh, of course, most of the modern people wouldn't have any idea about that. But uh, if you, t um, uh, we bought a bunch of it and we put it in tastings with Burgundies and you know Ponzi and Erath and Irie wines and you know it was a stellar wine. Uh, Richard was very hit and miss kind of guy in terms of his quality, but in '70 he made a a, a beautiful uh, Pinot. Um, that was 1970. 1970. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and and then that's how I ended up connected with this vineyard. My mother was dating somebody who said, "Oh well, if you like Pinot, I I know this this guy in Oregon, Jerry Preston, and you should go down." So I, uh, one of my trips to California, I called him up and said I was, you know, going to be going to California or coming from California. Could I come see him and? I came out here in 71, I think. See, yeah, I think it was 71 was the first year because they had just started planting. So uh, they were just planting, like, the vines then? Right. Uh -huh. Yeah, this vineyard was planted in 1970. And Jerry uh, was in partnership, not a formal partnership, but he and Dave Lett were best buddies. And Lett was going to get grapes from this vineyard. And Jerry was going to make his wine in Let's uh, winery because when Let's started, you know, that was a huge space and he didn't need it all. And uh, so uh, Jerry got a lot of cuttings um, from uh, uh, David Let. Um, uh, like I had some of the first Pinot Gris in the state was planted here. I had one row, but I never, never. Uh, did much with it, but uh, uh, I was a thorn in in in, uh, in David's side because uh, David let um, for the delayed the onset of, of Pinot Gris as an Oregon product because when he was the person that was that had a sort of an exclusive on it. When people called and asked to buy cuttings from him, he wouldn't sell them cuttings. He burned all his cuttings rather than selling them so that he could remain, you know. And I had these 50 plants here, so people, you know, Ponzi and Adelsheim, a bunch of people, you know, they got cuttings from other sources. But, uh, yeah, I, it really, uh, uh, that was something that really 
irritated me. Uh, uh, David looks. David's uh, got m- many great qualities, but he looks after David first and foremost, and uh, so he was uh, busy trying to, instead of being Johnny Appleseed and saying, hey guys, let's get Pinot Gris going, it was, well, if we can keep it as small a group, you know, I think Ponzi and, and uh, uh, um, yeah, it would have been Ponzi at that time, and then later Adelsheim got cuttings, but uh, yeah, there was a uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. For the uh, um, so I came here and met Jerry for the first time. Uh, what was Jerry's last name? Preston, P-R-E-S-T-O-N, and his wife's name was Anne. And uh, he uh, uh, lived in this trailer. He put this trailer up here in 1970, and. Uh, we, he used to have a porch all along the front. We'd sit out on the porch, and the first wine I ever had of David Letts was his Oregon Spring wine, uh, which David made because he didn't want to call it Pinot Noir since it was from Young Vines. He was following the Burgundian tradition of, you know, where they they don't they sort of declassify everything, you know, mm-hmm. um, until the vines are old enough, and then they. You know, they, then they'll put Premier Crew or Grand Crew or something. Otherwise, they tend to sell it off in bulk or put it under a second label. So it was really funny because uh, Jerry, um, I'd come up from California and I'd visited Sutter Home Winery. This is before they discovered uh, White Zinfandel. And back then, they made maybe 40 different varieties of wines. Uh, they bottled. 40 different varieties. Some of them they didn't make, like they bought their sherries and ports and stuff. But the old man was in charge, and uh, uh, they had a burgundy that was a field blend wine. And this was back when I first went to the Napa Valley in 1969. uh, You know, there were no good restaurants. The The best restaurant was at the Napa Valley Airport, a steakhouse. Uh, there were no restaurants in St. Helena and and uh, all that. You know, it was just, you know, Italian families and so forth who were just working class people who happened to make wine and there was no food and, you know, the price of wine was so cheap back then that Sutter Home had wine that had been 20 years, I think, some of it, in redwood tanks been sitting there um, you know and then um, uh, and they were selling it at a buck a bottle by the case and and this stuff was yeah, it was just fabulous and and we kept buying it and then as Americans started to discover wine they they rapidly moved through and then they got down and then they were into newer vintages and so forth. But anyway, that's the wine that I had in my car. I bought cases of it in my little Volkswagen. And so when when Jerry told me that David Lett's spring wine was two dollars a bottle, I said, "Geez, that's really expensive," you know. So I didn't buy any of it. And then a year later, I came to visit um, Jerry again, and. Uh, to taste wines and stuff as we hit it off pretty well and uh, he uh, we were drinking uh, I don't know whose Pinot's and Let's and a bunch of people's and okay so anyway so we're tasting these wines and Jerry uh, brings out this wine in a brown paper bag and he pours me a glass of it and I go Oh my God, that's wonderful. That's great. That's fantastic. I, man, I want a lot of that. And he pulls it out and he says, You dumb shit. This is the wine I offered you a year ago, the Irie spring wine. Oh. He said, See, see what one year in the bottle does to Pinot? You know, and that, that was a, that I can say was a uh, transfixing moment in my appreciation of how much better Pinot is 
with bottle age and that it is not as a lot of the wine writers and so forth say, you know, something to be drunk right away. I think that, that Pinot gets much, much better after it has uh, um, uh, time in the bottle. And if it was up to me, I, I wouldn't, I would drink almost no Pinot younger than five years uh, in the bottle um, if you really want to experience what what it's about. Because, you know, the the Oregon spring wine that I tried right after bottling was this simple fruity sort of fruity huh? fruity huh. pleasant well I'm not using fruity the way a lot of people do to mean sweet uh-huh. now, to me fruity means having lots of fruit character and s- sort of simple just sort of fruit characters and very fruit driven maybe I should use that term because fruity has been degraded down to something else but um it's been degraded to a symbol a synonym for sweet wine Um, and I'm not using it that way it was a fruit driven but you can it was very simple and elemental a year in the bottle that thing had started to do what I told you about Pinot it started to develop the complexities and the layers and the etherealness Um, and that's that's what it's all about I've always when after I um, tasted Irie and and Erath, who were the two main uh, suppliers um, uh, of wine, Ponzi was starting to to do some stuff. Um, but I, I I tended to focus in on Irie, and and I, I felt that David's wines always were a, a little too uh, light. They were they just were just a little too. There wasn't enough there there. Whereas Eras early wines had a lot of there there, but they tended to be very soft and lacked acidity and structure. And what I wanted to do was take the sort of the skeleton that Dave Lat did really nicely, the structure of his wines, and take some of the voluptuousness and a little of the fat and put it together and that's the style of wine that I wanted to try and try and make. And uh, you know, it's sort of like like taking Twiggy and Madonna and sort of <laughs> <laughs> our, uh, Twiggy and uh, uh, who is the country uh, singer with the big boobs? Uh, uh, Dolly Parton. Dolly Parton. Yeah. It's like it would be like like uh, Dave Lett is sort of a Twiggy wine and <laughs> and Uath was making Dolly Parton kind of wines and I wanted to make a a Meryl Streep sort of thing in the middle. <laughs> So, um, but anyway, so that that's that's how it got started, and and uh, so Jerry and I were were became quite good friends, and and I could see their marriage was was having some difficulties, and in '73, uh, Janice, my partner at the time, and I showed up here in the middle of the winter, and uh, there was nobody. The house was empty. The trailer was empty. There was no phone numbers we called information all around and and there was no uh, Prestons and they you know and I said well the divorce obviously gone through and but I had told Jerry in 72 I guess that I wanted to buy a bunch of cuttings for Pinot Noir and Gewürztraminer to plant up my farm in Port Townsend because back then um, we all thought that Port Townsend might be a viable place to grow grapes in Puget Sound because it had such a low rainfall. It's in a rain shadow. Uh, As it turns out, it's also doesn't have the heat. But, you know, so I I had ordered all these plants and uh, so I was uh, up in Seattle one day uh, um, when I uh, my uh, uh, plans were moving on doing this winery up in Port Townsend and Jerry called up and said um, I'm selling the vineyard you know Ann and I are divorced I'm selling the I have to sell the vineyard to split up our common property and uh, do you want those plants because we have to get them off the property and so I said okay and I came he invited me down to a meeting of the uh, what was it called then 
the uh, Oregon Wine Growers Council. The state had split. Um, there was the Oregon Wine Growers Council, which was basically Willamette Valley wineries, and then there was the Oregon Wine Growers Association, which was centered in Roseburg with uh, Paul B. Ellen, uh, uh, the main driver behind it, that they were basically interested in sort of having social gatherings where wine was drunk and everything. And uh, the folks in the North Valley, the Oregon, had broken off because they wanted technical meetings. And so the meeting was, mm. Ralph Kunke was coming and speaking about the sterile bottling of German white wines. And I remember that talk. And the whole industry was there in one room. And uh, he gave this talk. And then we all, m most of us, went out to drink. And we went to Jake's Crawfish. And we, back then, $10 a bottle on a wine list was a lot of money. So we drank every bottle of wine that Jake's had on their menu for under $10. <laughs> um, maybe it was reds. Uh, anyway, we, we, ran, we ran them out of wine, the, the whole bunch of us, and we sat around and had this great time. And then the really hardcore of us ended up going to a tavern after, we got, after Jake's closed. And uh, Charles Curry, who was, was there, um, and, Chuck and Chuck and Dick Erath, and Jerry Preston and I uh, ended up hanging out very late. I can't remember. There were some other people there. And then the next morning, Jerry uh, got up, and we went around to compare hangovers with everybody. <laughs> and we went to Curry. Uh, I remember we went to Chuck's. And I don't... I guess we just went to Chuck's. We may have... I don't think we visited David. We may have visited. I don't think. I don't think we visited David. I don't think he was. Uh, I don't remember that. But anyway, then we came down here and to pick up the plants. While we were getting the plants, these three Mercedes Benz pulled up, parked out there, and I remember because I was standing there and Jerry was when I walked over to these people and every man was named Paul. Oh, is that right? Yeah, there's three Mercedes full of Pauls. <laughs> and they all got out and wandered around with Jerry and then got in the Mercedes and drove off. And I said, Jerry, those guys look like buyers. What What are you doing? Isn't the vineyard for sold? And he said, oh, well, the guy I sold it to reneged on the contract. And Jerry Jerry was a, a machinist and, a, you know, a sort of out of... Uh, un just sort of a working class background with this love of wine and he really was somebody who always wanted to help the little guy and so this kid had uh, he'd offered this deal to this kid that if the kid helped Jerry remodel his house he owned so Jerry could sell it that he would give him credit toward the down payment and he, I mean it was oh, one wow. of these it was one of these wonderful wonderful deals that people would kill to have and the kid, uh, after I met his father, I realized that, the, uh, the, you know, he didn't perform on it. He didn't. And so Jerry took the property back. And I said to Jerry, well, gee, why didn't you offer it to me? And he said, well, I didn't think you could finance it. And so I, I said, well, let me try. And so I went up to Port Townsend, went to all the banks and said, I've got 1,500 feet of waterfront that I bought, you know, and it's this value and there's this huge equity in it and, uh -huh. and stuff and there's a house and, and we're building a rental in the barn and stuff. And, and they said, well, sure, we'll, we'll loan you on that. What do you want to use the money for? I said, I want to buy a vineyard in Oregon. Oh, we don't make loans on out-of-state property. So then I went to the Seattle banks uh, that my mother had dealt with and other people and said, uh, I want to buy this vineyard in Oregon and so forth. And they said, oh, sure, we, we can loan on that. What, what, where's your equity? I said, it's important. I'm sorry, we don't loan on property outside of Seattle. This was back in the days when bankers were these little fiefdoms. So I thought I was screwed because I couldn't come up with it with the $70,000 to $72,000 to buy the vineyard. And this was in 1990... No, this was 1974. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, the... Uh, 
So my mother, out of the blue, uh, who was a depression, she never owned a credit card until she was in her 60s, and only then because when we were stranded in San Francisco or someplace because my uncle forgot to tell us when we went to his son's graduation that we were welcome to graduation, but all the rest of the events they were doing by themselves, and we had to, you know... So uh, we had we thought we were going to be hanging out with them for four days. So we just come down and didn't have a car. And so mother went into a car place, tried to rent a car with cash, and you know <laughs> how successful yeah. that is. Yeah. Anyway, to make a long story short, she uh, one day at breakfast just said, "I'll I'll mortgage the house, and you can use that money to uh, um, buy the vineyard." So that's. I did, and then Janice and I, who were uh, uh, partners at the time, moved down here in 74, and uh, um, Jerry was sort of our, our viticulture consultant. I didn't I knew winemaking because I'd been working at a winery for, well, since 70, so off and on for four years, and um, but I didn't know anything about agriculture. I didn't even know how to start my tractor. Yeah. We had a D2 cat, and it was a uh, wasn't one where you just turned a switch. You had to you had to start a pony motor, and then you had to engage gears, and then the pony motor started turning over the diesel motor, and then when it got up to enough, then you could throw it into gear. So anyway, I I, moved, I came here in this in May of 1974, uh, May or March. I can't remember. It was one one of those two, and uh, probably March. Um, and the uh, it was raining so hard that I thought I had a permanent stream through my Riesling because the water was flowing. I mean, it was about that, you know, flowing down through the area, uh, through the hill. It wasn't Riesling then. It was, and uh, uh, I, I I made all the mistakes that 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 young people make in not listening. I mean, here I had Jerry, who, who knew a lot what to do, and if I just listened to him, Jerry said, look, you've never farmed before. You're, you're coming onto this farm in, um, yeah, must, was it March? I thought it was March, or maybe it was May. We were really late in the season, but March, arriving the middle of March, anyway, the vineyard hadn't been pruned, it had gone through. It had gone through a year's year's divorce, previous year. So, um, and he said, "Look, you know, just prune it and then get the get the uh, the thing working, and then next year you can consider planting more acreage." But no, I was so without knowing what I was doing, I ordered a whole bunch of plants from Charles Curry, and. Uh, uh, they were hothouse greenhouse plants that were terrible. Um, what uh, what varietal? Uh, Chardonnay and Pinot. Uh-huh. Uh, what I found from the thing was that ninety percent of my Chardonnay was dead. About fifty percent of the Pinot Noir was dead, um, and in the Riesling, maybe twenty-five to thirty percent, because the uh, these are the starts that. Uh, well, the first plants were planted in 71, and then there was plants planted in 72, and the ones that were planted in 73, basically when the divorce went, Jerry moved off and Ann got an order and kept him off the property. So she just let all the young plants die. Uh-huh. So um, so it was a, the vineyard was a mess, and what I should have done with the Chardonnay is just bulldoze the whole thing and start it over again. But I was focused on, you know, so we were going through the grass here trying to find Chardonnay plants next to, you know, I mean, the grass was, oh, it was a mess. And then on top of that, then I tried to plant plants, and they got here late, so we were putting them in like in July. In July. Yeah, or, or late June, and we had... We were watering with hoses, and we we didn't have good weed control back then. You didn't have herbicides. You didn't have Roundup, and uh, we didn't have a tractor that would uh, 
our our track we couldn't go both ways we'd only go down the rows so there was grass all the way down the rows and we had a french plow which jerry gave me but the problem with french plows is they're only viable for about two weeks when the you got to get in and turn the soil at the right time and if you don't the plow just zings along and so we we had weeds everywhere uh, we lost probably 50 to 70 percent of the plants we planted um, so it was a you know it was a horrendous start to viticulture so 74 and 75 were spent learning viticulture and then in 76 um, my friend who was renting the barn up in Port Townsend and was remodeling it um, I thought to you know for a, uh, a winery but he was remodeling it for a home and so instead of the big rooms that I wanted we had all these little teeny rooms uh, but anyway Duke came down and he was a carpenter um, and we had two high school kids and myself and we built the winery in 1976 wow. and uh, we didn't think we were going to be done, so we sold about half the Pinot to home winemakers. That's what I did from 74 and 75. I sold my grapes to home winemakers and uh, got the incredible price of $800 a ton. Uh, and uh, then, so we, we started off in 1976 making one barrel of... Uh, regular Pinot and a bunch of Nouveau. Um, when I bought the vineyard I had, uh, in fact Jerry already had a label made up, Gamay Beaujolais. Uh, and then we learned that it wasn't Gamay, it was an upright clone of Pinot. You, you know, California had been calling this wine Gamay Beaujolais and it wasn't even Gamay. It, they, they had Napa Gamay, which was a uh, derive from the Rhone, and then they had Gamay Beaujolais, which was an upright glowing clone of Pinot Noir. And when we learned, when, when UC Davis finally admitted they'd made a mistake identifying these plants as, as uh, Gamay from Beaujolais and that they weren't in Oregon, we required everybody to call it Pinot, and we had just incredible fights among oh, you can't call that great Pinot because it, it isn't like all the other clones of Pinot. You know, it's very different. And da, 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 da. And, and, but this is among the Oregon growers? Yeah, this is among the Oregon growers because we put in the labeling regulations in 78 when uh, uh, I guess it was Bill Fuller who I was talking to Dave Adelsheim the other day and because and, uh, we were there for the new revisions of the... Uh, labeling regulations that just went through and I was a supporter of them and there wasn't a huge number of people in the uh, Willamette Valley who were active supporters of it uh, other than David Adelsheim and myself and three or four others um, and I was saying that I was trying to talk about how the regulations got started and so forth and sure enough it was the, the thing that that triggered it was Bill Fuller was um, part owner and winemaker at Two Alton Vineyards, and Fuller at at that time the the BATF did not require an appellation of origin on a wine, so Fuller put out a wine saying Two Alton Vineyards. I can't remember what the wine was. I can't. Um, Honestly, I can't remember, Giannis, whether it was a red or a white. So all I remember is that the grapes uh, came from Washington. The wine, All the grapes had come from Washington. Mm -hmm. And Fuller put out this wine that said, To Alton Vineyards, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, or White Table Wine, or something. To Alton Vineyards, To Alton, Oregon. I mean, uh, uh, Forest Grove, Oregon. And so... The consumer picking up this bottle of wine would have thought that it was an Oregon wine, and uh, David said that that was the the impetus that 
that caused him to hit his computer and start putting out the uh, the, the regulations and uh, uh, I remembered that Fuller really caught hell from all of us but uh, his partner was a banker in California and so all his interest was was the bottom line and uh, Fuller being a California he was the only uh, enologically trained I mean Erath and Lett and uh, uh, um, Ponzi, well, I guess I guess Lett went through the program, but Ponzi and Erath hadn't, and I hadn't. We were all just learning on the job. Um, but Fuller was an actual winemaker who had been working for Louis Martini and stuff. But he was a California winemaker, and he had that set. And the mindset in California was, uh, we don't care whether we call it Burgundy or Gamay Beaujolais or Champagne or anything. You know, it's just who the hell cares what you call it? You just sell it. You know, you just make it and sell it. Yeah. And here we were, we were all, <coughs> we were all just mainly fresh out of being consumers, and we still all had a consumer mentality. And we were we were just outraged that somebody would would make a wine from grapes outside of Oregon and palm it off as Oregon wine. If you go now to the east coast to Virginia, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, even there's a place in Massachusetts. Um, you go into these wineries and probably in some of them 90% of the wine they're selling is bulk wine that they bought from either California or Washington or you know and the the same thing. They don't, you know, they just they don't have a label on it. it says American and American, um, American Pinot Noir. And people say, "Oh man, this is great Georgia wine." Well, it isn't Georgia wine; it's California wine. But you know, you can go into those tasting rooms, and so th that kind of thing is 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 going on rampantly on the East Coast and probably in the Midwest too. And it would have gone on rampantly in Oregon if if we hadn't all gotten up in arms and said, "Okay." We're going to stop this. We're going to require that any Oregon wine have an appellation of origin on it that tells where the grapes were grown. And uh, that was the start of it. And then, then the provisions for you know banning uh, European names uh, was was brought up. Uh, you know, like Johannesburg Riesling, Gamay, Beaujolais. And to give you an example, I mean, I already had a label for Gamay Beaujolais. Uh, you know, Gamay Beaujolais was a hot wine back then. You know, but I, my mentality wasn't, oh, Myron's going to be able to make a Gamay Beaujolais. My mentality was, I'm part of the Oregon wine industry, and we are are going to have truth in labeling, and that's what we did. Um, and the first regulations, the OLCC required that we get unanimous approval of every wine licensed bonded winery in the state of Oregon. So we, we had to make some real compromises. Uh, Paul B. Ellen refused to change his name of his wine from Johannesburg Riesling to uh, uh, White Riesling or Riesling. And uh, so he was grandfathered in, you know, with the provision that it wouldn't transfer with the winery. Um, and uh, hmm. there were some uh, other provisions uh, that were um, put in to placate various various people. Um, and thing, yes, go one ahead. One of the things I wanted to ask you is like. Like about the the wine industry, the culture, you know. And we've been talking a little bit about like the culture, you know, like when you started out. Mm -hmm. How how is the culture now different, the same as like when you were starting out here? Well, the culture is 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 has been. I would say that the culture's been diluted a little bit, but the... Diluted in, in what kind of a way? Well, uh, I would say that, for, first of all, in when the industry started, everybody except for Fuller, um, and he 
was a part owner and an operator, but he had a financial backer. At that time, ERATH was still ERATH. He hadn't gone into partnership with anybody. Mm -hmm. Ponzi was Ponzi. Myron was Myron. Uh, let's see, uh, the Campbells had started. Uh, Sokol Blosser had started. They Sokol Blosser uh, had some uh, family money. But basically, uh, most of us were owner operators. You know, Bill and Susan back then did almost everything. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Ponzi and me and Irie and Dick and, you know, we were all owner operators. And most of us, uh, with the exception of David, um, uh, and Fuller had no formal enological degrees. And you might check. I don't know whether David actually ever got the de got a degree in. Did he graduate? I can't remember. I think he did. Um. And and I think his degree is in viticulture rather than enology. I have to look at my notes. So anyway, anyway, uh, David had gone to Davis. Chuck Corey, who was who was the missing voice because he 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 died and he he blew, burned out and left. But Charles Curry was a major, major influence in the early industry. And if you talk to Dick Erath, particularly, or you talk to his son, uh, Charlie Curry, or his uh, stepsister, uh, Betts Curry, you'll find that, that there is a different version of who is the uh, first person to plant uh, uh, gray Pinot Noir. Uh, there are several people who, th who think that... In the, in the Willamette. In the Willamette. You know, <laughs> Lett gets the credit, but these people, I mean, say that it actually was, uh, it was, was Curry and that he was the main force and that Lett read his dissertation on... Uh, evapotranspiration and so forth and picked up on Charles' ideas and then came up here. Uh, but um, as I say, um, Charles was very, very influential because he had a viticultural training and he gave a lot of lectures and classes that the whole industry went to. But the main thing was that when the industry started, as I say, when I came down here in 1970, the whole industry was in one classroom. Yeah. And, you know, for years we all met at the Tigard Firehouse. Um, um, I don't know. God, it must have gone up through the mid-'80s. Um, and... You know, the, the the whole industry was together, and we all had a sense. Now, this the schism in the industry, there was if there was a schism, was between the Willamette Valley and the folks to the south. And as I say, that basically uh, came about because of the. Uh, if you ever knew Paul B. Ellen, dude, um, he was um, a wine snob par excellence. Uh, his wines weren't very good, um, and he was all into the, you know, the, the, the ritual of wine and the, you know, and having wine tastings and drinking and partying and socializing and all that kind of things. Uh, the greatest of the grape started down there, and that was, you know, whereas all of us, up here, we're, you know, the, the, the core of the thing was the viticultural. We had two committees. We had a winemaking committee and a viticulture committee of the Oregon Wine Council. And our meetings were, you know, we were all trying to figure out how to make better wine, how to grow better grapes, how to get new material in from France. Uh, um, and uh, so it was a really tight community. And the uh, the bonding, as I say, we were consumer-oriented, and so our, 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 the, the regulations that we passed were passed because we were, none of us had a large economic stake, and those of us who had economic stakes were willing to give them up 
because we were all concerned with creating this new region, Oregon, with where we were we were leaving the 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 bad guys of California and all their nasty labeling and their phoniness and their fake wines and their mislabeled wines and we were here pursuing the purism you know we were the pure you know people the hippie winemakers uh you know we were we were focused on it you know anytime anybody brought up something about marketing or or you know that's going to make it hard for us to sell wine our response was you know when you make the best wine in the world, we're going we're gonna to give the consumer true wine. We're going to label it, and it's, they will come. So anyway, that sense of all, we all hang together, we all hang separately, has, is the, the driving difference of the Oregon wine industry. And difference uh, from the rest of most other wine regions in the world. People come to Oregon, and they are blown away at the level of cooperation among wineries and people. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, my brother was here until 1970. He was here from uh, 78 through 81, maybe, yeah, 81. Um, and then he went up to Washington, got a job as a winemaker in Washington, and he would call me up, and he was complaining about all these problems. And I'd say, well, if you don't have that piece of equipment, just, you know, there's 10 wineries within 20 miles, 50 miles, if you just go borrow it. And then I'd get a lecture. Iron, this isn't Oregon. They just don't do things like that. You just don't call up people and run over and, huh. you know. And, and, you know, people, you know, and... Uh, uh, the uh, so that spirit. I mean, that spirit created the IPNC. Although one of the things that you, you sh one of the things that's being rapidly forgotten by the young winemakers is that the IPNC was originally started by the McMinnville Chamber of Commerce and the Downtown Association in cooperation with the local wineries to promote McMinnville and gradually those people I mean the original money that was loaned I mean uh, who's the uh, oh you wouldn't know him you're not from McMinnville um, the local stockbroker um, oh Christ if you need his name put a note down I can call Vicky uh, and US Bank loaned like a thousand bucks and and uh, uh, oh, this Corrigan, Dan Corrigan of Corrigan Associates. You know, these, uh, and, uh, uh, oh, uh, he, shit, he was with um, Hewlett Packard. He was the head of Hewlett Packard here, and Hewlett Packard, uh, they all supported it, and that's what started the IPNC, huh. okay? It came out of this idea, let's have some event that attracts the world to McMinnville and helps promote McMinnville and the Oregon industry. And and now if you talk to some of the younger winemakers, I mean, you know, the, the group of them actually proposed that we move the IPNC to Salem. And, and we had to come out of the woodwork, we meaning the older people, you know, and, and say, are you guys, are you guys crazy? You know, this event was created in McMinnville to promote McMinnville and to promote the wine industry and now that now that it's it's successful and everything you want to move it to Salem because Willamette University can give us more room I mean come on guys so we had to shoot that down and that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I say the culture has diluted a little bit is that now today 90 per, uh, 70 percent of the wineries have high except for the little teeny 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 guys have hired winemakers the owner doesn't do the winemaking anymore I mean there's very few there's some of the small ones like ransom spirits and some of the most of the small wineries that where the owner is the operator are are, are kids that 
that were cellar masters or winemakers at another place and they're being allowed to make their own brands while they make wine for somebody else you know you 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 know all the different wineries like that and that's where the exciting part of the industry is right now is these kids who are you know who are who are um are sort of duplicating what we did in the beginning they don't have a you know they're not one of these people who say oh i've i'm selling my property in washington dc and my accountant said that i needed to reinvest and oh um, I hear vineyard land in Oregon's a good investment. Well, I'll move out and and buy vineyard land. And oh, now that I've got vineyard land, maybe I should set up a winery. You know that the the people who founded this industry were here because they were passionate about making great wine and and establishing a new wine region and creating this thing. And um, now we've become successful. And the product of success is that the people who want to be associated with success are now coming in. Uh, there was a, a really neat story on NPR the other day about a neighborhood in Houston that was in the, the, the ghetto. And uh, uh, over the years, it began to you know have the same problems and it became one of the roughest and neighborhoods in in Houston and apparently a bunch of young artists most of whom were were black uh, decided that they wanted to give back to their communities and they moved in and set up an art center in this neighborhood where they they restored some brown stones uh -huh. and, uh, and and set up art institutes and and got the local kids coming in and the parents and over a period of years they gradually got this thing and then as it became a, more of a neighborhood suddenly the developers decided it was now safe enough that they could gentrify it and they were talking about you know how these people had been the original people were coming in focused on the neighborhood trying to do something for the neighborhood and everything once they began to bring the property values up and make the neighborhood safer and and all this thing then suddenly the developers came in well the same thing happened in Oregon we struggled for years and years and years out there you know um, and now Oregon is a success and so people are coming in I mean, I there was an ad, uh, Sue Horseman's uh, bulletin for the Oregon Wine, uh, the, Oregon, the Willamette Valley Vineyards Association. There was a guy that said, you know, I want to buy a winery. So just out of curiosity, I called him up. And, and he was very honest, the guy that I talked to. He said, oh, this is a... Um, not, not an ego winery. What's... Uh, What's the the term that you use? Um, yeah. It's a. Uh, it's like a showpiece. It's. Uh, yeah. I I can't think of the word. We'll probably think of it. But anyway, the guy wanted to buy a winery. He didn't want. He didn't care whether the brand was established. So all he wanted was a facility with a small vineyard, so that he could he could hire a winemaker and and make wine, so he could be part of the wine scene. Uh huh. Yeah. You know, uh, sort of personal, and and uh, so um, you know, you get you're getting those people in, and that's what what I'm calling the sort of the d dissolution of, of the culture. But um, uh, like Oregon Pinot Camp, to go back to the good side, Oregon Pinot Camp was set up by a whole bunch of the young winemakers and uh, people who, uh, uh, again, the spirit of cooperation, you know, uh, they, they set up something and, and their idea was that, you know, we none of us like going out on the road all the time and selling. Let's bring our customers to Oregon and it's also a better selling experiment. And, you know, and, and they didn't restrict it to just a little group. They, they offered it out. Um, and, and so that was another example of the Oregon culture of, you know, let's work together and let's do things together to promote the industry. Now, I'm very sad that 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 what has happened now 
is that the industry is starting to fractionalize. Part of that is just the natural product of growth that when you get so big, you can't all meet in one room. And uh, but there, this all these new AVAs, which are, in my opinion, incredibly premature. Um, most of the AVAs, in in my opinion, are are driven by marketing rather than viticultural concerns. Um, and you know, people will Russ Rainey will who who is a, an absolutely wonderful person and who is in favor of AVAs because of he believes strongly in the sense of place, uh, but. You know, I went to the meetings for the Ola Hills, and there were people standing up, saying, "Well, if we don't, if the other people do it and we don't, we're going to be left behind. So we better get our AVA too." And then the son of a bitch who did that, uh, I just uh, people like that just I just can't stand them. This asshole gets up, gives this big speech about the AVA and how we must go on, and so when he his winery, does he build his winery in the AVA to help promote it? No. The son of a bitch puts his winery in Carlton because Carlton's where it's happening. And so, in, you know, th that kind of person is the kind of person. They're, they're here to exploit, and it's me, me, me. Um, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm not as angry at Gino Cuneo as I am at this other guy because Gino when he bought his winery, bought it because he wanted a winery with no vineyards because his real love is warm climate grapes. He's, you know, and and Gino had uh, his winery in the Ola Hills and he saw that Carlton was going to be the place and he got a partner and he moved out. Um, but he had no attachment to the Ola Hills in the sense of... Uh, 99 percent of his wine was uh, uh, coming from Washington anyway, yeah. and so forth. But this other guy was, you know, giving us all this crap about how we had to have an AVA and by God the Ola Hills, and then the son of a bitch just goes and runs away instead of saying, "Okay, if we're going to have an AVA, we're going to develop it. Well, I can put my winery here. Maybe I won't make as much money, but if I get in and work with all you guys, then we can establish something." No. He and Gino, you know, they all cut and run for the, for the quick uh, uh, and easy uh, road. Um, but that's not what we did when we started the industry. So, they, and then we now have the Dundee Hills Winery Association. We have, you know, they're active and they're doing their own events and stuff. And the Oregon Wine Advisory Board decided that they weren't going to put out a brochure for the whole wine in industry anymore. They were going to put out something that's just sort of a general overall description of the various AVAs and stuff, and then say, you know, you can get... Um, uh, it's, it's, I haven't even seen the thing yet. It's supposed to be like a big envelope that you can put the Willamette Valley Vineyard brochure in or the Dundee Hills brochure and everything. And they say, you know, that's going to work. But what it's going to create, Yanis, is more factionalism. Because before, I didn't like giving out the Willamette, well, we used to be the Yamhill County Wineries Association. I had those available. But I didn't like to give them out because I didn't, if I wanted to, I wanted to promote the whole industry. I wanted to give people the Oregon wine thing to say, Oh, you know, sure, I, I, I really think we're doing a great job here, but, you know, if you're in Eugene or if you're in um, uh, Corvallis or you're in Roseburg or you're in Hood River or you're in uh, Ashland, you know, here's wineries and you can go to them. Well, now people come to my winery, the brochures, the Oregon brochures are gone. What am I going to hand them? I'm going to hand them the Willamette Valley Winery brochure because that's the only brochure I have. Yeah. So now my friend... Ted Gerber and my friends at Ashland Cellars and uh, the guy that's bought Hillcrest, you know, I don't have a brochure that I can say to these people, oh, if you're going down there, here's that. And maybe I'll get Deanne to, to 
call up and, and, and you know order a bunch of Southern Oregon winery brochures and, and put them out, but that's a pain, and a lot of people aren't going to do it. So instead of promoting our whole industry, what we're doing now, and the Ola Hills will do it. I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not going to put my particular energy in it, but sooner or later, somebody in the Yolo Hills is going to get together, go to the Oregon Wine Board, get money. We're going to produce an Yolo Hills wine brochure and so forth, you know, and that's fine. And we need to do it, you know, from an economic point of view. We need to promote that. And I like doing ads, but I, you know, I would, I would rather have a brochure that I'd say, here, you know, here's the Yolo Hills section. And if you turn over, you know, because the idea is to promote the industry and to promote you know the the whole industry and to tell people where there's good wine and not um, you know well here we're in the Dundee Hills but you know uh, oh Ken Wright Cellars isn't in the Dundee Hills so I'm not going to tell these people to go to Ken Wright because I've got to promote my my thing you know uh, yeah. I did you, were, um, you mentioned that yeah. um, like you're excited about some of these young winemakers that have like the, the passion. Right. Um, you know, they're not into it for the money, but they just want to make really good wine. What are well, I'm not saying they're not into it for the money, but they're well, but they're they're they don't have a sugar daddy financing them, okay. and they're they're starting out like you know I who, who, are, some, who are some of those well, people Tad Seastead at Ransom Cellars uh, Tad Seastead yeah um, Ransom Cellars John Groshaw G-R-O-C-H-A-U he I don't know whether he's completely on his, on his own now he used to be uh, the uh, cellar master uh, work at Brick House, oh. um, and he's now got his own little brand out. Uh, but he may also he was going anyway. He's gone into partnership with with somebody to start a little winery. He's a you know um, uh, oh uh, this guy hasn't even got it. His name is uh, Brian. Um, Hang on a second. Uh, uh, Mikey's Monday. I won't. Where will I have his? Just a second. Maybe. Maybe I'll have it. I don't remember his last name. Oh, I have that trouble all the time. Well, my old Palm Pilot used to go, but they whoever designed this one. Um, Huh. Marcy, Brian Marcy. M A R C Y. C Y. Yeah. And does he have a winery? No, 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 he. I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. In fact, I can get some from another place. That's okay. I'll just get this. What do you want, the silver uh, pumpkins back there? Or? Oh, I was going to get my trackers, but I'll get them. Well, well, here, I can reach them. Where are they? Right there. You can see a half pack of oh, yeah. right there. Yeah. And there's another one on the other side over there. Oh, that, that's for us. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's tall. <laughs> um, uh, Brian Marcy's a really new example. I mean, he hasn't got... He is the winemaker at Coelho Winery here in Amity, and he's... Bought, he and his wife have bought some property up in uh, uh, near Gaston, and he's just figuring out how to f financially put in a vineyard, you yeah. know, and so yeah. forth. So I, I, he, he, he's he's fun. Then um, uh, what about the guy that used to be the um, sales guy at um, Anami? Um, I can't remember his name, and he just. Uh, Gosh, he just built a, um, a neat little winery that's, oh gosh, it's on that road between, uh, on, off of, I guess it's off of 240, is it? Um, just out of uh, that Yam Hill area there. It sits up on the hill, uh, it's south facing, um, saved up money for a long time. Is he a dark haired? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I know. Um, he used to have a distributor company. 
I think so, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly who you mean. Yeah. But I can't think of his name at the moment. I can't um, either. Uh, shoot. Uh, anyway, I'm kind of looking. It's like a, uh, um, at those okay. Uh, then there's... Uh, oh, crap. Um, I'm glad somebody else has that problem. Oh shit! Um, That's okay. It'll it'll come. You know. And and I, uh, yeah. The, you know, this is this is um, you know. It kind of gives me right. What would you, Myron? When you when you think back about you know, it's like your your um, I don't want to call it a career, but your adventure in the in the vineyard here. It's like what would you say was like like probably like the most difficult moment or uh, <laughs> like the thing that was just most trying and you just almost said oh screw this <sighs> oh. well actually uh, um, the, the screw this moment is, is more <laughs> Is more recent. I mean, you know, in 2003, uh, uh, this this is uh, well. By the time you get your book out, it'll. But you know, we're not. We haven't been making money for uh, several years, and um, uh, I was at my rope's end in 2003, and my two young winemakers helped me come up with a an idea of how to get out of the hole we were in um, and I was just I was burned out because I was spending all of my time um, trying to figure out how to get enough sales or money so that we could keep operating and I, that was everything I was doing was just focused on you know I wasn't uh, uh, I I never got into this thing with um, a sense of making money and I have made it through um, in spite of uh, incredibly some incredibly bad mistakes, I've made it through thirty, well, thirty seventy four, thirty three years, um, and gone from nothing to a winery that's producing. This year we're back up to twelve thousand cases, and so forth. Um, but uh, because I wasn't f ever focused on what can we do to make money, um, and I didn't have a coherent plan to make money, eventually I guess things just caught up with me. Um, and uh, so... You know, if you look back, you know, I was out in the market yesterday working, and so I've been in the mar I've been in here 34 years, and I have a worse presence in the market than probably 40 wineries that have been created in the last 10 years. Um, I uh, didn't clearly focus. Um, started off in 1984 when we had a huge lousy vintage mm -hmm. and before that I made small amounts of, of wine and, and pinot and everything and then I ended up with this huge amount of uh, we, we started making blush in 84 we made uh, Oregon pinot and and I sort of allowed myself to be um, 
marketed for for too many years as a Riesling and Gewurz person with inexpensive Riesling and Gewurz. If you you know if you go out in the market or you go talk to people, um, they, you know. Uh, you go talk to, to most winemakers, um, they will, they talk about my white wines. But commercially, I was with uh, Columbia Distributing, which was Henny Hinsdale before that. And I just didn't pay attention to the fact that they were, uh, they were, they were placing me as inexpensive Pinot, my Oregon Pinot, Riesling and Gewurz, and that was it. And um, I was marketed mainly to supermarkets, um, and uh, I was the inexpensive stuff. And the idea of Amity as the quality Pinot Noir producer sort of got lost in in that period. And so, you know. Uh, so I don't have a, I don't have a brand like, you know, I, I constantly go back to the comparison between Dave Adelson and myself because until David got his new partner that, you know, that allowed him to build the four million dollar winery and everything, David and I were pretty much similar. We both were struggling. We had he had his winery in his house. I had my barn next to my house, you know, and so forth. He were, you know, but I mean, like David in the early years decided to, when we were all buying grapes from Washington, David made a Semillon. I made a Solstice Blanc. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I didn't market as well as Susan Blosser, as, uh, Sokol Blosser has marketed her Evolution number 9. Um, and uh, consistency. So, um, you know, Adelsheim became regarded as a incredible Pinot Noir brand way before Ken Wright and you know I mean he was eclipsing Erath and on a par with Ponzi and so forth and wine's styles wasn't much different he used a little more oak but when when uh, his former winemaker was there it was a lot of neutral oak and uh, so forth but David kept more of a focus and he became known as the, and while I was the inexpensive Pinot, he was the, not the, not the single vineyard in the reserve, but his main Pinot became sort of the, uh, what's now the $25 Pinot. Back then it would have been like the $15, where, you know, when we were in the 8 to $10 range, David was in the, Twelve to fifteen dollar range, which was then the quality, and then you know his Elizabeth's reserves and so forth. But so, in the, this all came to a head in two thousand and three, and basically, the Liz and Darcy sat me down and said, you know, you've got to return to your roots. You have got to stop buying grapes from your friends because they're your friends. You can't have three years' supply of Gewurztraminer sitting in your winery. Um, you know, you can't have, uh, uh, you know, huge quantities of, of, of Pinot Noir sitting, uh, you know, waiting to be sold and so forth. You've got to, you know, you've got to, Go back to your original image up through about '85, um, when you were when you were regarded as one of the leading stars in the Oregon Pinot industry, and and you so we we remade ourselves in 2003. We got rid of the Oregon Pinot, we got rid of all the vineyards, both for white and red grapes that we were buying for cheapness and just went back to our quality producers, cut our production from down to about 5,000, well, I think we are only about three, three or 4,000, my mind's like yours, uh, cases from whatever it was before. We, 
and we sold off the inventory. You know, we we cut. Uh, we took vintages like 97 that I'd been sitting on waiting and waiting. As it turns out, I didn't wait long enough because the 97 reserve finally now, 10 years later, has finally come around. And Is it's a that right? pretty nice wine. And I sold it off at $4 a bottle. $4 a bottle? Mm-hmm. Wow. But um, so anyway, we, we eliminate it. We, we, we've come back. We, we're focusing on just a few, uh, um, you know, Good vineyards were quality in the uh, and and so forth and we're you know I mean I I scoff about um, the people but but you know the 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 Ken Wrights and the David Letts and uh, uh, those are two of my uh, key examples to give you the thing the 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 philosophy of uh, I'm hard to get to, you know. Uh, you know, my my stuff's very exclusive. Uh, I'm not open to the public. I'm I'm not a, really available that much to the press unless I unless you're one of my people, you know. And that, are you guys coming for lunch? Are we going to be in your way? We can move. Stuff? We will move. I mean, the basic conflict started out when I started this operation. I wanted. The basic conflict uh, um, between the basic the basic conflict between um, making a living off wine and what I and my lack of focus on that. Um, when I started, I wanted to do two things. As I said, I wanted to make the the best. Pinot Noir in Oregon. Um, but I also had this other idea that I wanted to make wine for people. Uh -huh. Okay. And um, so I wanted to make inexpensive wine for, and I wanted to get wine out to people because the people I love are the people that love wine. And the people I hate are wine snobs. Uh -huh. And my um, and those two conflicting emotions sort of tore me apart as far as, 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 as ever really focusing because one of the, the problems, uh, and I had a, just a brief 15, uh, well, two years in the limelight when I was Robert Parker's favorite boy from uh, 1983 through 85, um, you know, it was Amity, not Adelsheim or Ponzi or Erath or Irie. That was the wine that that brought Robert Parker to Oregon. That Robert Parker fell in love with the first time. It was my '83 Winemakers Reserve, um, and uh, so I went through a period where I was the object of um, snork, cork, dork worship. You know, um, and uh, and I financially it was very nice. Um, I refused to release my '83 winemakers reserve when Parker declared it the best Pinot I had seen outside of Oregon, and so I sat on it until the. Um, Glow was gone and then released it. It still sold okay. You but sat on it because, like, you thought it wasn't ready, ready yet. I didn't think it was ready, and I wasn't going to release my wines according to the dictates of some wine writer. And so the uh, uh, the you know the result of that is, of course, you don't stay in the focus very long as the wine writer moves along, and then the next person they write up. You know, if he's willing to release everything and so forth, and then all the people can, you know. But I just refuse to to allow him to to dictate my thing and and so forth. But the, it's not Parker specifically, although he was the worst thing. Parker and the Wine Spectator were the worst things that ever happened to the wine industry. Um, not because they are bad people or, as people say, that the spectator is bought and sold, which I don't a a agree with the 
um, you know, Ponzi and Ken Wright don't uh, have enough advertising in the Spectator to buy anybody, and the Spectator is is you know writing them up and creating their their status. It's just that we've come from having thousands of voices in small wine shops all around the country s telling people this is a good wine and try this to a couple of voices telling everybody that these are the good wines and everybody now is going oh well if it isn't spectator or it isn't parker then you know it you know you're just you're just not you know, you're just not there. You're not on the best restaurant list in Portland. I mean, you go, I went out marketing, you know, you see the same brands, you know, the Bergstrom's and the Ken Wright's and the Lynn Penner Ashes and the Archery Summits and so forth. You know, they're all, you know, you take Parker's top scores and you take the Wine Spectator part, top stores and, and, you know, you create this band of people that are, that are, that are out there. But, um, I got totally, off course in, you know, in not doing, in, in not realizing that as a small winery, I couldn't make inexpensive wine. I wasn't big enough to make inexpensive wine, and I was making too much inexpensive wine for the size of winery I was to do anything other than just barely exist. And that's what I've done for, uh, I mean, you know, I take, I, I had my income increased on January 1st because by law, my salary had to be increased because I was below the minimum wage. Okay, yeah. and this is 19, what year are we in? 2007. So after 34 years, I'm, I'm, I'm not taking out the minimum, I'm, I'm taking out the minimum wage. Yeah. And that's the only, you know, as Vicki keeps pointing out, that's the only reason this winery succeeded is because I've taken so, uh, and hardly anything out, everything else has been plowed back in to pay, to pay things. But, um, uh, so, you know, I was very happy. I didn't care about that or anything, but I don't know what started to go to go wrong. I guess my costs started to creep up or, or, or whatever. But, you know, in 2003, I ran into this, you know, brick wall and, uh, I was ready to sell the winery and get out. Um, I just, I was... It wasn't fun anymore, you know. It wasn't fun anymore because I was I was just running from pillar to post, trying to sell enough wine to cover the next bill, to make the next wine and so forth. And and I, you know, I had lost my focus. I was making some very nice pinots, uh, small amounts of them, but my whole focus had had had, had gone off onto producing these these. Uh, inexpensive wines and uh, I'd become relegated to the you know the Riesling Gewürztraminer low-end Pinot guy and I hadn't I had lost the reputation as being one of the great Pinot Noir winemakers in Oregon and uh, my uh, uh, because I, I was focusing on trying to keep my costs low I was you know you know my the quality of the wine would go up and down because of the grapes, you know, I'm talking about in my major production. And I was still making beautiful reserves and, and some single vineyards, but it was, a, it was an infinitesimal amount. And, uh, you know, my re reviews began to say, uh, uh, oh, who's the English? Uh, how, Johnson. Uh, if you look in, uh, I don't even know whether I'm in Johnson's anymore, but you know, they would rate me as good on Riesling and Gewurz, and then they would say spotty on the Pinots and so forth. So anyway, um, I mean, I've, I've had a wonderful run, and I wouldn't trade it in, but as I tell everybody else, that when you start in this industry, the most important thing is not the piece of ground, it's not your winemaker, it's knowing what the hell you want to do 
And if that's what you want to do, then saying, if this is what I want to do, then this is what I need to do to get there. Yeah. You know, um, and you can't, um, you can't, if, if you don't do that, and, you know, and that's why somebody like Ken Wright is just, just an incredible example. I mean, the guy knew exactly what he wanted to do, and he went right toward it, and he did it. Dave Lett's another person. You know, I can tell you all sorts of stories about about Dave Lett and and, and so forth. But the thing you got to say about the man is he's he's never changed his label since he started. You know, he hasn't changed his Pinot Noir style since he started. He set up a style and he stuck to it. Um, and uh, I don't know whether they're you know whether he's financially viable or anything, but being the being perceived as, as since Curry's out of the picture, he's clearly the only uh, he's perceived as Papa Pino and everything. So you know, I mean, uh, he gets uh, all sorts of attention. So those two people are, in my opinion, good example of people that said this is what I want to do. And that's it. Ken Wright, particularly. I mean, he's he's probably a millionaire now. And, you know, he came up here, he didn't have much money. But, uh, um, you know, all his wines now are pre-sold and everything and uh, uh, so forth. Yeah. But... Um, what about, you know, like, thinking back in, the, in those 34 years, what was, like, what was, like, a real aha kind of a moment? You know, something that was just like, whoa, this really worked. You know, maybe mm-hmm. something you were trying or, or something that... Uh, just like you'd call it a real success story. Well, I think, um, and I don't want to take more credit than credit's due, but I was one of the people that was very um, much in favor of the idea that we had to challenge Burgundy head on in order to get any recognition for Oregon. And some of my colleagues didn't like that idea. They thought that we should be able to establish ourselves just on our own merit. But I was on the Oregon Wine Advisory Board in the uh, early years when we did the, um, from the, with the 83 and the 85 vintages. We put on a series of tastings. Um, Steve Carey, um, somebody else you should interview at, at uh, um, Yam Hill Valley. Steve Carey started a company called Carey Oregon Wines in the early 70s. And he tried to put Oregon he had like 17 Oregon wineries and he went around the country selling us to, as a group to various distributors and so forth. And um, Steve was also a, a proponent of this because what, what we would find and what, what, I've, what I found in, and Dave Lett found the same thing when he went down to San Francisco, you know, you go down and you're a new region uh, and they try your Pinot Noir. And, and, and most people, um, there's very few people who can, who can spot something new that is incredibly unique and of a high quality and recognize it for what it is. Uh, most other people try to relate to the new thing in terms of something else that they've experienced. Mm-hmm. And for the burgundy drinker if you poured them the pinot noir and they knew it was pinot noir they'd say oh this is this is a new region this this wine can't be that good Mm -hmm. and therefore it wasn't that good Mm -hmm. so we would walk in i would i would walk into um Sorry, uh, Janice, I just can't remember the name of all the, mm-hmm. the wine shops that were the hot ones in the early 80s in San Francisco. But you'd walk into these places, and you would take your top end, your winemaker's reserve Pinot, which was probably selling for $15 back then. Um, 
I shocked the whole industry when I charged $30 for my 85 reserve. Uh, it was the highest price for a wine in Oregon for a brief while. Um, the You go in with your winemaker's reserve, which is, you know, like a, a premier or grand cru and that kind of, uh, of quality. The guys would open it and they would say, oh, this is a... Well, it's better than a pot to grand, but it's sort of like a, a good Bourgogne or maybe believe, maybe a Cote de Bone or, um, you know, or, um, and uh, they'd say, well, it, it's a nice $7, $6 bottle of wine. Well, after a while, I just got, I just got so tired of that. So I walked, I, I walked in to wine shops that carried Burgundies, and I would say, okay, uh, my wine sells at 15. I want you to pick a bottle from the same vintage, because back then I was releasing late enough that my wines and the Burgundies were coming on the market about the same time. I want you to go to your shelf, and I want you to pick a wine that is twice as much, at least twice as much as my wine. I'll buy it off the shelf, and I just want you to pour the two of them. I don't want you to do it blind. So all I want you to do is pour the two wines and draw them together. Uh -huh. And what you got when you did that was suddenly they had a reference point and they suddenly realized, oh, these wines are very similar. Oh, these, this isn't a minor league team. This is a major league team. And it should be playing in the major leagues. Now, so some of the times they said, oh, wow, yeah, I really like your Pinot better than this wine that's twice as much as yours. Sometimes they like that one. But mm -hmm. every time the frame of reference changed and they suddenly saw that we were playing in the same field as Good Burgundy and we weren't, you know, our best wines were competitive. So I pushed this idea um, and... Uh, we set up a tasting. The Oregon Wine Board set up a tasting in New York. I could show you the, uh, uh, if you look through our, I could give you our old scrapbook uh, to look at. Um, and it was a turkey shoot. Mm -hmm. We had, the, 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 the thing was very simple. We went into, I don't know whether it was the House of Burgundy or one of the, the big Burgundy purveyors there and we said we want you to select six or eight burgundies in in, in in this price range and in this vintage 83 we took the 83 vintage because the burgundians were promoting the 83 vintage as god's gift to the world and our our 83s are the ones that parker had written up and so then we put it into a blind tasting and we have quotes i mean steve carey uh, oversaw the tasting and we have quotes from, you know, these people saying, you know, I can tell a, a bone from a, you know, a bone greve from a, a Marceau, from a, a Gevray Chambertin, and I can tell whether it's this and that. And, you know, this is going to be a, this can be like shooting fish in the barrel and everything. Well, when the tasting was over, the two questions that were asked of the people was one, where did the wine originate? And two, your rank. Oregon ended up with one, two, three, four. I think the top four places out of the... I'd read even it was five. Well, it may have been yeah. five. But it, yeah. we, we just creamed them. And, but even more important than that, they all couldn't tell the Oregon Pinot from the Burgundy. They picked, huh. they picked uh, Sokol Blosser's uh, um, uh, wine as a Gevray Chambertin, and they picked the Gevray Chambertin as a Oregon Pinot, and you know, it was a, com they could not wow. tell the difference between the wines. And these were not, these were people who had been buying and selling Burgundy for years. This was the cream of the New York crowd. And their eyes just fell open. 
Okay. Now, I was actively involved because I was on the Wine Advisory Board and I was either the chair or, or an active member on the marketing committee and was involved in that. And then we took the show on the road. We took it to, we did it in Denver and the same thing happened. We took it to San Francisco. I can't remember. We may have done it in Los Angeles. That I'm not positive about. But it was a revolution. Suddenly, you know, an Oregon surge. That was our that was our first big surge. Parker and all those tastings. Then the whole industry hit the wall. And the reason they hit the wall is because at that time the way most wineries were buying grapes on sort of an open market, paying a price, uh -huh. and then the the wine would be released later, and there was no uh, correlation between what was being paid the grower and what the wine was priced at. So what happened in 1985 was I had people coming into my winery in 19... Well, we had this huge, horrible 84 vintage. And so everybody was stocked up on this 84 because, like, I... I had open-ended contracts, so I, you know, so 85 comes along, the best vin vintage s until 99, in my opinion, and I had no room to buy thing. People were coming and offering to give me the grapes and just wait and be paid, you know, I, I couldn't take a lot because my tanks were full. I had all this goddamn 80, 84 in there. Well, what happened is... Because '85, the the this all this publicity on the '83 vintage happened in 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 either the fall of '85 or in early '86, so the 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 price of grapes for the '85 vintage was cheap. I mean, I had people offering me you know 500 a pound, you know, I mean 500 a ton. Just the prices uh -huh. were ridiculously low for the quality. Well. After we got all this publicity, the wineries released their their wines at very high prices. They everybody said, "Wow, you know, we've been struggling here for years. We never got any money, man. You know, I was going to release it at ten, I'll release it at twenty. I'm going to release it at fifteen, I'll release it at twenty-five. The prices just jumped. Uh -huh. Okay, well that was fine because the vintage in '85 was so incredible that the prices were still cheap, and everybody's going, "Wait a minute, you know, look at." Yeah, I'm paying $25 for this Oregon Pinot, and, 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 and it just was in a tasting against a $100 Gevray Chambertin. I'm getting a bargain. So, man, Oregon just hit the boards running and everything. Okay, the growers went, oh, you sons of bitches. You didn't, sh you didn't come back to us and say, hey, you, we made all this money. Here's some of it. Yeah. So in 86, the growers raised their prices. 86 was not a great vintage. It was a marginal vintage. Not, eh, it was just sort of an eh, okay vintage. Uh -huh, uh -huh. The growers jacked the prices up to conform to what the prices had been for the 85, looking at their, their share. And the wineries took those higher prices and raised their prices on the 86 vintage. Uh -huh. Okay, those wines were snapped up just like that because everybody had missed out on the 85s. They were all going to get the 86s, and all these people who didn't couldn't pronounce Pinot Noir but suddenly heard that they were supposed to buy it. They all bought it, and then they started opening the 86 bottles. Yeah. And then 87 came along, and 87 was not a another good vintage. The Spectator and Parker crapped on us. And Oregon lost the momentum, and California stepped into the gap at that point. We had gone up. Our prices had gone up too fast, so forth. Suddenly, we were no longer the darling children. California, with its marketing thing, started stepping right into the gap. And it took us until, I think it was the 94 vintage, was the next aha moment in Oregon, where... Parker and the Spectator all came back and said, this is great. And then in 95, 
we didn't make the same mistake. We had a lousy vintage in 95. No, well, not a lot. I made the, one of the best Pinots in Oregon in 95, which is right on because all the young Californians didn't know what the fuck to do when they had rain coming down. Because um, they'd been in here in 90, 91, 92, 93, 94. Uh, but we just had a, a, a roll, and then, you know, you come up to uh, that that role then came up to um, the movie. When was that? Three years ago? 2003, 2002? Maybe 2003. I, I don't remember I don't exactly. Know. Yeah. yeah, but we, you know, we were on a roll. 9 11 knocked the thing under us. It knocked it out. You know, I mean, it knocked the whole hospitality industry flat on its butt. And, and so 2000. Well, the stock market crashed in 2000, then we had 9-11 in 2001, and, you know, those things um, just kill, you know, killed a lot of people, and it really hurt, hurt me, not as much as some of the, uh, uh, you know, boutique guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, there was people, I remember, <laughs> I was visiting some friends in California who make you know, less than a thousand cases of eighty dollar a buck Cabernet off one of the not Howell Mountain, but one of those mountains. And I remember in like oh two that she uh we were having dinner with them and, and she said, Well, you know, I can't see you guys tomorrow because I've gotta to go to Los Angeles. My my distributor wants me to come sell. I've I've never had to sell my wine before. Wow. You know, so that that was the California boutique. And now you know things have come back, and the, and Oregon is 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 a juggernaut moving along, and Pinot Noir is an in incredible demand, and uh, we're there, and we're we're now getting all the things just like the the, the neighborhood that the artists develop. We're getting all the uh, yuppies that are that are that are coming in, but we also have the the uh, uh, there's still uh, you know. A, a, a lot of people out there um, Holleran Holleran the winemaker for Holleran is Jay is it Jay Summers I think it's Jay Summers he's the winemaker at Holleran he's he's another person who's he's trading his his uh, he's he makes wine for Bill Holleran um, but he makes his own. He's allowed to make his own wine, and uh, you know, there's another sort of a, you know, th there's there's quite a few of them. Um, one of the reasons that I always, until Darcy came along, I was always my own winemaker. As, as I saw what happened, uh, you know, like with Joe Dobbs, you know, Joe became the famous winemaker, and immediately he. He was hired from one winery to the next winery, it's just like one of these baseball players, you know. Uh -huh. you, you know, you're just running around. We, we're now in the era of the wine superstars in Oregon, winemakers who people are hiring. Uh, uh, Laurent uh, Montelieu, you know, he was at Willa uh, uh, Kenzie for all the time. Then he, somebody with money approached him, and so he was able to go out on the, you know, his own and. Uh, you know, he he's just done his thing. He's not like Joe that's moved around. But now Joe's got wine by Joe, and uh -huh. you know. Um, but uh, that's the only the only uh, 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 downside. But but the 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 great thing about it in in Oregon, and you see this like uh, Jason Lett, who's taken over from his father, and is is. Um, Fighting this uh, um, hotel up on the hill above his place, um, you know, you still have people with a passion and a vision, uh, you know, that are that are there, and the industry, um, as, as shown by what the young folks did with OPC, that was all mainly young folks that did that, um, you know, is still. We still have this culture, and when uh, 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 I think it was Lynn Penner Ash uh, 
went out and, uh, no, no, it was Bergstrom, pardon me. Uh, Penner Ash may have done it too, but Bergstrom bought out uh, the vineyard that Ransom Spirits was getting his Riesling from, came in and basically went to the owner and said, I'll pay you a lot more for the grapes than Tad is, can do, give them to me. That just wasn't done in this industry. People, do, you know, uh, you know the uh, past couple of years, uh, nobody had any grapes, so people running around trying to lease vineyards. And A to Z um, went around and, and called a lot of my growers. But to their credit, when they found out the grower was contracted or with me, they said, we, won't, we don't want to mess with Myron if if you want to talk to Myron and he'll release some of the grapes. Well, Bergstrom and Penner Ash uh, don't seem to have those qualms. It's just a question of me. And so Bergstrom went and, and, and actually bid the grapes away from somebody. And that's just not part of the culture yeah. that's here. And, and you know, you can go in, interview Josh and ask him, say that some people are a little bit out of shape that you would do that to a colleague and see what, what he has to say. I thought Josh, when I first met him, was this little teeny, him and his wife, and I liked their wines, and I was so excited about them. And I still like like Josh, but I didn't know he had that huge money behind him that he has. Yeah. You know. So what does it take, what does it take to make a, a, a really great bottle of pizza? To make a really great bottle of Pinot, it takes the right climate and the right site. Um, and once you have those two, um, careful winemaking. And what's careful winemaking? That, um, okay. The, gr the great wines are made in the vineyard, okay? And the wines that you and other consumers would declare were your favorites and everything, most of those wines um, were the product of a good shepherd, okay? Uh, and by that I mean they got the grapes from the vineyard to the bottle without screwing up okay that's what a great wine is now we'll get a whole bunch of uh, debates about that if you want to know great winemakers that's why I was beating my own horn about the 95 vintage I kicked ass in 95 because I knew what to do under adverse conditions I knew how to make an exceptional Pinot Noir with grapes that that um, other people had turned down. I, in 1998, for, uh, was it 98? Or was it 97? Or was it 01? Uh, I could call Carl Danauer and ask him, but Carl, I was buying grapes from Carl. This is when I was still making inexpensive Pinot, and Carl is the king of inexpensive Pinot grapes. And I think it was 95, I think it was 95, but I'm not sure. It could have been 01. Carl got caught in the rain and uh, he, uh, Carl has a tendency to overcrop a little bit and he, uh, he uh, had contracts with a whole bunch of people and he literally sent the trucks over to these wineries and they took one look at the grapes and rejected them. They wouldn't take them. So I ended up taking, uh, you know, Carl didn't have anywhere to go. I mean, nobody would take the grapes. They'd already been picked. They were going to, you know, so I said, okay, Carl, I'll tell you what, I'll make the wine and if we can sell the wine, I'll pay for the grapes. If we can't, we won't. And 
I applied the techniques that I knew from going through 1984, which was made 80, 95, looked like a picnic. Um, and I made a wine that I took down to the steam, you know, Steamboat Pinot Noir mm -hmm. Conference. Um, yeah, if you want to talk about that separately, I can talk to you about that because I helped start that. It's mainly Steve Carey's baby. But um, uh, I took the wine down, and, and s we, it's all blind tastings. Mm -hmm. And two of the wineries that were there had rejected the grapes, and they were giving this wine wows huh. in the tasting. And then when I told them where the grapes came from, they were just blown away that I, you know that that good wine can be made from those grapes. Uh, I was over visiting with uh, Roland at Archery Summit the other day, and Roland was talking about needing to test for botrytis because botrytis can be inside a cluster and the outside of the cluster, we're talking of Pinot, well, you know, he was talking of anything, the outside of the cluster can look perfect and you can have botrytis inside and so you can have all the problems that come with botrytis, all the gluconate, you know, all the, all the horrible things in terms of filtration and off flavors and <laughs> and Roland made this remark, you know, he just couldn't resist. He said, yeah, I said, all these guys with their sorting tables, you know, these clusters go right on through their sorting tables and they got botrytis in the center. And, you know, what, what you need to do was, and he was talking about, oh, and that one he was talking about white, white grapes because he said he brings in his juice and he, and he lets it settle. And, and if, if he uh, uh, tastes after it's settled, if he tastes any of the off flavors caused from botrytis, he bentonites the shit out of it and cleans it up uh -huh. as juice before you get into the wine. And he said he was getting calls in this one year from all these wineries that had their sorting tables and everything and the grapes had gone through and they still had botrytis in them and they still had these off flavors and the guys had made the wines and now they had the wine and they wanted to know what to do but as Roland says and we all know if you bentonite a finished wine you strip the shit out of it whereas you can bentonite a juice and, and not so you need to take preventive action and, and those are the kind of uh, tricks of the trade that people who have dealt with adversity know how to do and those are the people that are the great winemakers. The great winemakers aren't the people that that can can uh, uh, bring in grapes from a, a great vintage and uh, you know put them in new oak and get their 94s and sell it. I want to see what those guys do in a difficult vintage. Um, but uh, the great wines will come from great vintages, and great vintages is defined as any damn fool could make a good wine. Okay? You know, I mean, 1998 was a great vintage. Why was it a great vintage? Because any damn fool could have made a, 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 a great wine. There were absolutely no problems at all. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. you couldn't have more perfect grapes. And that's what a great vintage is. It carries the, the whole boat up. You know, it's the rising tide. What do you think about, like, you know, during harvest, and this is probably a good year to ask this question, is like, during harvest, what do you think about? Well, in a, in a year like this, what you're doing is, is you're looking at the weather on one hand, and you're looking at your grapes on the other, and you're, you're, you're trying to make a decision that involves a lot of risk, okay? And risk-adverse people don't make very good wines in years like this. And because? They will pick too early. They will pick, given the choice between the huge rainstorm that's going to come and making a wine out of slightly underripe fruit, they'll go for the underripe fruit. Anytime. And underripe in terms of, like, sugar or and flavors, flavors and flavors? Flavors, tannin development and flavors uh -huh. and um, uh, yeah, I've, 
is I, I've been here 34 years, and my philosophy has always been, and it only failed in 1984, has uh, been go through the rain and, and come out the other side. Um, and uh, we did that this year. Um, that's why I'm so excited about Darcy and you know, talking about young, uh, young winemakers. Uh, she's making her own little teeny bit of wine, but I don't want you to write about that because she hasn't got all her licenses, so I'm, I'm covering for her. But, um, you know, she's, she was exactly the same, same way as, as, as I would. You know, she would, we would taste these, these, wine, these grapes or these juices, and she would say, it's not ripe. We shouldn't pick it, you know. And the fact that four inches of rain was supposed to be coming, you know, we said, well, you know, we know that we're going to get a shitty wine if we pick these grapes. Yeah. You know, because it's not ripe. It doesn't have the flavors. you got to go for it. Other people would say, oh, we're going to suffer too much damage. What if the rain doesn't stop? I'm going to lose my crop and everything like that. And so you've got to have a gambler's instinct, and uh-huh. and, and 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 I do, um, uh, and that's you know that's the critical thing. But sometimes it's not that easy. Sometimes it's not. Oh, these grapes are clearly underripe. It's well, they're almost ripe, yeah. and that's an awful lot of rain coming down the track. And then you're sort of flipping a coin. You're saying, now, this isn't going to make a bad wine because it's not underripe, but it's not fully ripe. It doesn't have, you know, it, it could, you know, it, am I, what, what are my, what are my risks here? Is the, is the, is the grapes going to be able to make it through that rain and come out the other side? Or are they going to fall apart? Now, we were very fortunate this year as we had cold rain. We had cold weather. Very little development of bad things compared to what it could have been. Um, But, you know, on those kind of things, then you... um, uh, Do you need to catch that? No. Um, It... um, Part of that is going to be experience, and you know, they, just like you know, there's these phenomenal athletes that can hit balls and everything. Some people have better taste buds than other people. Uh, some people have better memory, taste memories. I have a absolute shitty taste memory, and it's and by taste memory I mean that you can taste something. And when you taste a particular thing in it, you can remember where you tasted that before, in what circumstances, and so forth. Is all I do is go, oh my, sh- what's the name of that? What's the name of that? Just a that's my wife. Uh-huh. So anyway, you know that's it. And, and, and I mean, you've got to give. Let, let me give you an example. I mean. Uh, let's get back to Ken Wright because I think he did some impressive, some impressive things that he needs credit for. And uh, you know, what I try to do, Yanis, is I can say that I hate Oki Pinot Noirs. But if you loved Oki Pinot Noirs, I could say, oh well, if you like Oki Pinot Noirs, go try this and this. So I I don't say oh, you're a stupid shit for liking Oki Oak Pinot Noirs. It's all a matter of, matter of taste. And I like to try to give people the credit for what they've done, even if I disagree with them in other areas or so forth. But Ken came up here, and I remember when he was at Nick's in the early years, and he, he was selling some of his Cabernet that he made in California. And I said, you know, and people were starting to talk about this guy. And I said, why the fuck do we want to listen to a... California Cabernet maker that's come up to Oregon. Well, I was dead wrong because Ken had a simple philosophy. His philosophy was that I want to take and take the crop level down on vines to one cluster per shoot because if I do that, 
with even not just the warmest sites, but many other sites, I can be assured that my grapes will get ripe and will come in before it starts raining in Oregon, even in a year like this. Well, this year we got we got burned. Mo a lot of people got burned. But, um, and he carried through with that. And he he has, has made wine in that style that, you know, when you, when you do that and keep the thing low, you end up with a big extracted Pinot Noir, very ripe top end flavors. He combines that with whatever oaking regime he does. He's not the heaviest ochre that of, uh, in the place. And he makes a style that has been consistent and is very popular. And he's now doing very well. And that's what I was talking about, about somebody, you know, and he had a, vin vin a vision of a, of a new approach. And, um, you know, the, the, the leaf pulling idea came came up earlier I, I don't credit Ken Wright with that I don't know who I'd credit with uh, we, we all picked it up out of New Zealand and Australia leaf pulling and crop leaf pulling shoot positioning and crop limitation are the three things that have made Oregon Pinot Noirs uh, more consistent and a better overall quality in the past, since those techniques were introduced than before. People keep telling us, oh, the winemaking back in 74 wasn't as good as it is now. For a lot of people, they're still making wine like they were in 74 because they're using the Burgundian very simple techniques of, you know, um, they're not, you know, intervening a lot, but, you know, Ken Wright and, and a lot of these people now have evaporators for concentrating the fruit if they get rain. I mean, they've got high-tech shit out there. Yeah, yeah. Some of the smaller people are just using those simple techniques. The other area, which Darcy has opened my eyes to, is I experimented with white wine yeast quite a bit and saw variations, but I didn't see a lot of variation in red wine yeasts and the few yeasts that the young ones had... I'd go to a technical seminar, I'd go down to Steamboat, and people would be saying, RC212, it's God's gift to Pinot. You know, so I'd come back and use RC212 and go. Um, but Darcy is a microbiologist, and she's introduced, she uses about six or eight different yeasts. And just two days ago, I had the same wine with eight different yeasts, same Pinot. Incredible difference between our champagne yeast, which is what we've been using, which made a very simple fruity wine, and this Melody yeast, which and F83 yeast, they gave a lot more tannin and a lot more body and a lot more mid palate to the wine, just from you know the same grapes, different more yeast. Tannin. Yeah. Huh, that's interesting. And and then the the last thing is different enzymes. Uh, they, they, the yeast people and the enzyme people are making all these breakthroughs in new yeast, uh, new enzymes to be used in white wine and, 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 and red wine. Um, like there, there's a thing called Opti White, uh, which Darcy showed me. We did some experiments, and the same wine treated afterwards just on the juice with Opti White had a much more round and fuller mouthfeel so we could reduce the residual sugar on the wine and still end up with a, a, a nice round wine that didn't taste out of whack. So th that's one of the new frontiers, I think, that's, that's really exciting with some of these young, technically trained winemakers. All right, two last questions. One is, like, what did you sell your first bottle of wine for? I think it was five dollars. And what was it? Uh, it may it may not have even been that high. It was uh, Pinot Noir Nouveau, nineteen seventy six Pinot Noir Nouveau. It was no more than five dollars. It may have been less. Last question: What has the vineyard taught you about life? What kind of lessons have you learned? <laughs> What is the vineyard? Yeah, the vineyard, or you can winemaking, you know, like this whole process. I mean, you said that, you know, like most of the winemaking happens in the vineyard. So what has it taught you about life? <laughs> I mean, you've been doing it for 30, 
more than 34 years, I mean, in the vineyard. Well, I think the, the thing that, that the vineyard teaches you is that the very little that you think is under your control is under your control. <laughs> you know, you, 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 the vineyard has taught me uh, to live, you know, with uncertainty. I mean, you know, agriculture is all about gambling. You know, it's totally that way. Um, I would say, you know, and let me think on it, Yanis, yeah, because I'll probably, uh, my problem is why I could never be a politician. I always remember the appropriate thing to say about two days later. <laughs> but um, uh, I would I would say, I would say that. And, and as I said, the other thing that this has taught me is that, that, intangibles in are probably the most important thing in a business like knowing what the hell you're doing and being focused on once you know what you're doing what you have to do to get there and then laying out a plan to do it versus reacting to which is what I've basically done. I, I've been too reactive and not an, not proactive enough. And and in 2003, that really, the chickens came home to roost, and I went back to saying, okay, I'm going back to being more proactive. As much as I, I don't like it, I realized I had to raid, raise my prices a hell of a lot because I was too small to be selling wines, and I had to focus on making on doing what I came here to do, which is to make Pinot Noir and to be totally focused back on quality and and having fun. And if I'm not having fun, yeah, that's the other thing, you know, is that 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 having fun while you're you're doing it. People who can get up every day and go to a, something and be excited and interested. Diana said it the best way. She says, Myron. You know why I've kept working for you? She'll be here 30 years next month. She said, because every time I came to Amity, I never knew what was going to happen the next day be <laughs> from the previous day. We were always, we were always out there doing something. That's, yeah. that's been kind of fun, but yeah. Yeah. Marn, thank you very much for your okay. time. I really appreciate it.